Yeah. So you can see that the topic's name is uh, Venture Finance and Introduction. Okay. And this is the very, in this topic, I will try my best not to go too much in depth, but some basic fundamental issues I will raise so that we are in a position to discuss mo more in depth in topic two. Yeah. Uh, these are the three fundamental questions in every company. Be it a new firm or be it be uh, Ford, which is set up hundred more than hundred years ago. Okay, so whatever is the company, um, mature company, the new company, the old-fashioned company, the growth company, it would be encountering these three issues. The first objective. The first question which it would be grappling with is that uh, what long-term investments should the business entity must undertake? Remember, every company, if it wants to sustain, survive, grow, it has to make long-term investments. You can make short-term investments, but then they will be giving you short-term output, short-term results. That may not guarantee your longevity that you can remain in the business for a long time. So if you want that the company should survive, the company should grow, sh company should grow faster, in that case, the long-term investments are very, very important. So every company has to decide at some stage that which long-term investments it must incur. And that is what we shall study at some stage today, uh, that what should be the criteria of determining the long-term investments. The second thing would be, uh, where will the business entity get the long-term funding? All right, now this, is, this question one is our wish list, that we want to do these long-term investments. Question is, where does money come from? Where does resources come from? That we shall study in the second point. Where will the business entity get the long-term funding? to pay for its investments. That is where the word capital structure and the source of funding comes. The third one will be, uh, how will the business entity manage its everyday financial activities, such as collect collecting from customers and paying supply? Uh, if you look at the first topic, it is something about thousands of euros spending. Because you buy machinery, for example, or you buy technology. If you look at the second question, it says that to finance, to, to have the money so that you can buy thousands of euro worth companies, where will the money come from? So if you look at the first and the second question, I'm looking, I'm talking about the big money. Big money coming, big money going. The first question is about the big money going, investing. The second one is the big money coming. Where does money come from? But the common thing about the first and the second question is the big money. Do you have enough cash to pay the bill of your official guest? Do you have the money in your bank account to buy the raw material? Have you got enough money to pay the wages? These are not big money things, but these are the things which you encounter on daily basis. You never buy millions worth machinery every day, do you? No. Not even the big multinationals do it, let alone the small company. But you do these small two digit, three digit payments on daily basis. So that way, the third question is very much about your working capital management. Do you have enough resources to, to fund your resources? Do you have enough cash that you can pay your supplier? Yeah. All types of financing, not the types of financing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we 
con igual escenario, menos Q optimístico, menos negativo. Should we do uh, three escenarios for, for, for all these three questions, or should we just go to the most positive or the most negative? Or? We, uh, when we, when we do. Planning, so we are planning future investment. Uh, the businesses make the most horrible mistakes when they are having in the in the peak time. The businesses make very big mistakes when everything is going well. Because when things are not going well, they think more rationally. But when things are going so well that they are intoxicated by the success. Okay, that's the, that's the one uh, uh, statement I would like to give. The second thing is that, for example, in the topic capital budgeting, which we shall study today, we shall keep this aspect in mind. That how you're thinking, how your behavior, how your outlook, how the characteristics of the managers can also affect your numeric calculations. The data is not data per se, data reflect your mindset. Okay, so there's a lot of behavioral things which we bring into studies. Okay, so yes, we, we, shall, we shall incorporate these facts in our studies. I hope I answered you, yeah? Yeah, the question was, when, when we plan, we plan with one, Scenario in mind or multiple scenario. Several. Multiple scenario. This is why the word scenario analysis I, I added in the contents that we shall be adding when we do the whole analysis. We shall be studying different scenario. Uh, what I scenario is a little bit uh, complicated word to me. I like to call it what if analysis. What if this happens? What if your cost jumps by 10% and your revenue? is delayed by three months. You may have an estimate that, you know what, I, I pay cash, I get the supplies, I transform the inputs in my factory, product is ready, there is, there is a customer outside, I sell, pays me then and there. No, this is simplistic assumption. It could be possible that the supply is standing right there. Hey, I will not let you take the things away unless you pay me. But your customers say, oh, thank you so much. I like your output, but you know what? I will pay you after six months. Okay. So all these scenarios, these, we tweak, we play with the situations, and then we find out, of course, in the business, we always look at the downside risk. There's always a risk. When you run the business, can you have a risk-less business? Now you have a little bit positively distracted me. Uh, have you got any business which is riskless? Hmm? Yes, which business is riskless? Could, could be very little risk, but there is always risk. No, please, please name the riskless business. I want to know because I want to do it. No, of course, like I said, there's always some risk. Sometimes risk is by doing especially if you are doing let's say you start a company the person who's going to be the, your main buyer is somebody very near you family whatever partner mm -hmm. even. and he represents and he has so much money that he assures you that you can assures you but there's no guarantee but there's no guarantee so oh, yeah there, there might be so that so there's a risk political, political risk or whatever no, let's be specific. Is it risky or riskless? No, 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 no. When I say risky, it doesn't mean that it's extremely risky. Everything is, is relative. In finance, in business, everything is comparative. We, do, we don't believe in absolutes in, 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 in the study, in, in this academic studies. Is it risky or riskless? Worse, risky is which has risk. Riskless is which has no risk. Right. Is it risky or riskless? It's not, it's no risk, but it's very 
<laughs> no, please don't be diplomatic. Risky is the one which has risk. I didn't say how risky. Riskless is absolute zero risk, very categorical. So it's not riskless. So it's risky. All right. Risky. So you agree that businesses are risky. Okay. So there's no riskless business. The most riskless, or if I say the least risky, business is that you have surplus money, you have savings, and what you do, you buy the treasury bills of the government. The government is issuing notes, the bills, and you buy them. And all you get is the interest rate every year. That is the only riskless business. But even that is not riskless business. Because in theory, even the countries can become bankrupt. But the risk is less. But then so is the less return. What do you get? 0.5% a year. In fact, that 0.5% could be minus 1% if the inflation rate is 1.5%. Are you with me? If you get interest rate from the bank, 0.5, but the inflation rate in the country is 1.5%, you, you are losing money. Look at Finnish system. In, in Finland, the interest rate is nearly negative because we follow the Euribor, which is negative, okay? So even if we add, it's close to 0%, but inflation is not 0%. So basically your money is rusting if you keep in the banks. So even it means that even that is not riskless, all right? If you're losing money in absolute amount, you have 1 million deposit, okay, be happy. But what is the worth of this 1 million? It's going down. So we have, we face risk. And because we face risk, risk come from uncertainty. Uncertainty is the backbone of the risk. But then the uncertainty is not always negative. There can be some good surprises for you also. You can have a jackpot. When you have a jackpot, is it uncertain or certain? It's always uncertain because it was so certain that everybody would have a jackpot. But then this is the upside risk. Okay? It's an upside risk. But in the businesses, we always look at protecting ourselves from the downside risk. So we are more concerned about the downside risk. We are more worried about protecting ourselves from going down. If it is up, it's a bonus. Right? Maybe yes, you're right. Uh, it, it it can bring you some more challenges also. Yeah, I, I, I have seen. Oh, we are still so good. Mm. You know what? We cannot believe one time. Yeah. So the downside risk is something which we uh, always look for protecting. Uh, okay, and that is why we we adopt in the business conservative approach. Like for example, if I say that hey, uh, how do you calculate profit? Well, you can say profit is very simple. Profit is the total revenue minus total cost. And I ask you, could you make an estimate of a new venture for the next five years? How much profit will you get? Right? Then if you apply a flamboyant approach, which you must not, you will try to overstate your expected revenue and understate your expected costs. But this is when you look at the upside thing. No, in businesses, we always look from the downside spectacles. That we apply the downside risk. We want to protect ourselves from the downside risk. So what will you do when you are estimating your revenue? You always be cautious. Even though you're very sure that you will be selling 100 uh, shares at 50 euro per share, 
50 multiplied by 100, 5,000 euros. And even though you are very sure that you will be getting 5,000 by the end of the day, keep some room that there'll be at least two or three chairs which will become defective. And your customer would give it back to you. Or keep in mind that the buyer would say, even though it's a one buyer, one big buyer, he may delay some payments. And when you are calculating your total cost, again, apply the cautious spectacles. And you always try to understate your costs, uh, sorry, overstate your cost. They always be prepared for some unpleasant surprises. That even though you have agreed with the supplier that the price will be this, but maybe verbal agreement, he may charge more price from you. Or it could be possible that he is not able to supply you there, then and there. You might have to approach a different supplier and who may charge more price from you. It could be possible that he doesn't charge more money from you, but he delays the delivery of the raw material and your factory is shut. So we apply a different mindset when we look at the upside risk or the downside risk, okay? But that's very important, that how the uncertainty and risk uh, comes in the picture. So these are the three uh, things. Uh, you can have a look again, I would recommend you. And if you have any thoughts in mind, please have a look. But remember, you can be a multinational company like Coke and Pepsi, which has operations over nearly all the countries in the world, or you can be a company who is not even a company. You are only in a stage of idea. You're, you're only at the ideation stage. You're only in the thoughts. You are not even a startup. Be it a established, mature, a company with legacy, or a company with no track record, no experience, nothing. These three questions you have to grapple with day in, day out. I'll be quizzing you very often. When I get tired, I ask questions because then I can remain quiet for some time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the role of the finance manager is very important. In the large uh, finance, in, in, the, in the big companies where you can see that there is a special specific finance department. Uh, your CFO uh, is very important. In fact, in many cases, CFO is more important than the CEO because CEO will be only a decision-making thing, but the CFO has to really work hard to generate resources so that your plans are implementable. Okay. So CEO is always looking at CFO. Whenever you ask a difficult question to a CEO, CEO will call CFO. And CFO is the one who bears the brunt, ultimately. In the big companies, uh, the owners, do not include themselves so, so strongly in the day-to-day -day activities. In fact, they are completely decoupled from the operational activities. But as the company is small, like for example, let's say, let's go backwards from the big companies to a small company, to a small size partnership or a very uh, local enterprise, a family business, uh, their role of shareholders or the role of funders is more obvious in the day-to-day -day activities. The more the company gets bigger, more is the urge or need to have professional managers who may not be the shareholders of the company, who may not be the investors of the company but they have more knowledge, expertise, and know-how and skills. In fact, in many cases, 
uh, when a company become a multinational company or even a local public listed company in that case in that situation the role of shareholders on in the operational activities is nearly zero because that job is done by the trained salaried managers and here i use the phrase for stockholders or for investors i use a phrase called principal whereas for the managers especially the senior managers because they are the decision makers so in big companies anybody whose name whose designation start with the prefix c chief is a senior manager and they are in the executive board of directors of the company to name a few uh, ceo you all know cfo cmo um, uh, it could be cio nowadays because many it companies have a chief information officer sorry so, yeah cto could also be in in the tech companies the role of cto is very important but um, as i said before that you can be a very old fashioned company uh, or a tech company uh, for example a company like bp is a old fashioned firm they may not have cio or cto uh, but all the companies they have ceo cfo and cmo at least or chief operating officers right so these these designations are very uh, that is who i call as the agent all right so i have a reason why i call the shareholders or the stockholders as the principal and the managers as the agent the reason is that if you are a startup and you don't have any external finance you yourself are the financer and the idea belongs to you so basically you are a financer as well as an entrepreneur so you are a financer and a manager at the same time are you not right but what happen is that as the scale of business become bigger your idea is flourishing but now you need to upscale your business you need to scale up your business for this you need money for this you need more managerial expertise so maybe you are too much focusing on the idea development that you are not able to focus on the business realities business dynamics so that is when you need to hire the outside managers all right but when you hire them you hire them on the assumption that they would be catering to the interests of the investors people who invest in those companies so these people are assumed to uh, serve the utility function of the investors okay did i use any complicated word here i did use i did use intentionally so that you can notice it and you can ask me because if you don't ask me then i will ask you so as i said in the small companies uh the gap between ownership and control is minimum but when the company becomes bigger and bigger and bigger the gap between the company's ownership and control becomes more and more significant if i'm making a pulla in some small company here some small household business i make some pulla and a salad it's my idea it's my money and i don't have to hire any harvard educated ma manager to run this pulla making business so basically manager is the one who controls the business runs controls manages right and the owner is the one who invests so the gap between investor and controller the owner i should use the word owner and controller is very less but when the business become bigger then the gap between owner and controller become prolific you may have 1000 shares of nokia right can you just enter the head head office of nokia and you ask hey uh, if somebody stops you at the entrance of nokia's head office in is it in espo i think it's in espo yeah and you go to the head office and you say somebody stops you hey wait a sec who are you going to see well i am the owner of the company 
I can enter the office anytime I wish to. Look at my shares. These shares show that I'm the owner of the company, even though to the extent of thousand shares. Would they let you even enter the office? I don't think so. But then the company managers, they may not have a single share of the company, but they're on the show. Because in the big companies, as the scale of the business become bigger and bigger, the gap between the principle, the gap between the ownership and control becomes more visible, right? And it's not just that, uh, that the shareholders, uh, the, the manager have something against shareholders. No, the shareholders may not have the capacity to make the operational decisions. Today, we are seven, eight people here. Anybody of us can buy Nokia shares. Nobody will stop us. Nobody will check our qualifications. When you buy Nokia shares, will somebody check your credentials? Do you have any degree in IT? No. But when you take the operational decisions, you must be qualified to make decisions. So it's also a matter of eligibility. It's also a matter of, are you capable of making those strategic decisions? So in the big companies, the gap is bigger. And in some small companies, you may have some finance directors or in many companies, uh, I don't know how big your company is in Vasa, uh, but in many companies, even the chief accountant or a controller of the company can do the same job what CFO uh, does. So in the big companies, of course, there's a CFO. And as you can see here, uh, there's a whole hierarchy that there is a treasurer, there is a controller, and then some cash managers, credit managers, and all that and whatnot. There's a very big hierarchy. of. But then this is more valid uh, for a company, uh, which is really big. But in some small companies, uh, or even in the very small companies, uh, the manager is also the finance manager. He's, he's doing everything. But the point I'm trying to make is that when you, when you want to study the, the business finance, you should also be in a position to know that how big the company is. The bigger the company, the bigger is the gap between the controllers and the owners, more specific education, expertise, skills, know-how is required. That is the gap between the principal and the agent becomes bigger. Hmm? Do you think the gap between the principal and the agent is healthy for the firm? Uh, this is the chart. This is the picture I showed you. Uh, but of course, for a small company, it will not be the same. It will be much shorter. But even though the functions will not be shorter, the functions will still be the same, more or less. Uh, then in the companies, we have the controllers, uh, we have the treasurers, uh, we have the finance managers, and they have a little bit different jobs. Uh, controller, for example, is handling the cost and also accounting and tax uh, payments and maintaining the management information system. But at the same time, the word controller seems to be very police word, you know, very regimental and that's true uh, this is also a job of the controller to make sure that the resources are not wasted it's like strict about that there should be some uh, financial operational discipline in the company and which is rightly so a company is not a fun moreover it's not your money if it is your money please play bingo but because it's the investor's money you have a responsibility to make sure that the resources, not only financial, but also non-financial, like raw material, you, it, it must be maintained that you are making optimum utilization of those resources. Treasurer is more about uh, cash credit and maintaining the, the cash cycle. You know, I told you before that if your supplier is too pushy and only giving you two months credit, but you are giving six months credit to your customer, you are in trouble. All right, so this is the job of the treasurer to make sure that the cash flows, cash inflow and cash outflow at, at, at any point um, is not you know, disrupted. Uh, we have a 
uh, yardstick. The yardstick is that if a company's assets are more than liabilities, then company is solvent, solvent, right? But if a company's current assets are more than the current liabilities, current mean quick, short period, not 20 years, but now, three months, six months. If a company's current assets are more than current liabilities, then the company is called liquid. We want a liquid and a solvent company. Do you get my point? If a company's liabilities are more than assets, the company become bankrupt, insolvent, right? Same way, if the company's current liabilities are more than current assets, you don't become, you don't become bankrupt immediately, but your liquidity is in crisis. So what you have to do, you have to borrow from here, their high interest. And if you do it more often, like in, in your case, you, the example you gave, that they were having a cash payment. So there is a cash outflow, but there's no enough cash inflow. And the company has a range of emergency basis, short-term loans. If this habit, if this exception become a rule, it will not take too long. When this insolvency, uh, when this ill in, when this unliquidity uh, affect you, and make you insolvent. So your short-term performance have a knock-on impact or a cumulative impact on your long-term solvency. All right, and this happens in, in the example I gave you that all these companies who became bankrupt in an LSE, London Stock Exchange, they had a huge amount of profits but they were not having enough, very poor cash management they were doing, all right? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. I, I sometimes uh, have a uh, dig with some of my colleagues that if Enron, you know the Enron company became bankrupt, it's a classic bankruptcy case. If Enron was a bank, if Enron was a country, it would have never been bankrupt because somebody would bail out. And even if Enron was a company and even in the private sector, but it was a bank, it could have still survived. A failure of bank and a failure of a company, even though both are at the same scale, but they are having a very different meaning. You get my point? Let's say there's one company and the company assets, the company's value is $1 billion. It becomes bank, disappears. What will happen? There'll be human cry. Some people would be unemployed. Some people would be angry. There'll be article, a lot of things, investigation and blah, blah, blah. People have short memory. We'll forget it soon. But if a $1 billion worth bank becomes bank bankrupt, you can't imagine there could be a possibility of a full-fledged financial crisis in the whole country. So banks are always treated as holy cows. They're always treated more, uh, they're more sensitive, you know, they're more fragile. So handle with care. You know, when you have a carton, it says glass with care, handle with care. So banks are like that. They have to be handled. Uh, a company bankruptcy is very severe. Of course, it has its repercussions, but people, in comparative sense, if a bank becomes bankrupt, uh, it can have unmeasurable repercussions. Uh, what is a firm? What is a venture? What is an enterprise? Oh, this is my question to you. What do you think is a company? You may give me uh, different interpretations and different uh, ideas about a company, but I have a different way of looking at the definition of a company. I will not say the word company because company is a word when we register it. At the operational level, I would rather call it venture or firm. A firm 
has three components. Maybe a drone. Yeah. A phone is a collection of three boxes. The first box. The first box is the second box is and the third box is A firm is a collection of three boxes. Can you see it is financing, investing, operations. Financing. If you have to give a one liner answer, what is financing? Financing is where money comes from. Investing, where money goes, where it is. Where money goes to are your assets, isn't it? Let me, the money comes from. You are a company, you are a venture, you are able to arrange uh, venture capitalist, angel investors, crowdfunding, whatever, or an old fashioned bank loan, you have some private equity, all the money comes to you. Isn't a, so it money comes from, yeah? Can I also call it a liability? Can I call this money come from as a liability? Because the money comes to the business. There is an investor and there is a business. For a business, it's a liability because if I take something from you, you know, let's, let's say, can I borrow your pen? You give me, isn't a liability on me that I have to give it back to you? So when the money comes to, yeah, isn't? You don't think so? So if, if, if I borrow a pen from you, uh, don't you think that I'm under some kind of moral stress or a pressure that, you know what, I, have to, I shouldn't lose this pen or I shouldn't destroy this pen uh, because I borrowed from you and I morally should give it back to you. When, you. when you borrow somebody's car, that, you know what, my car has broken down. Can I borrow your car for today? You're, are you feel some kind of under pressure that you should take care of the car? You feel it, okay. So it means that when the money comes to the company, and remember, company is not same as the business is not same as the businessmen. This is not a sexist term. It could be business women. Uh, business is not same as the business men. Business has a separate. So even though businessmen have given money, the money belongs to the money is used by the business but it belongs to some investors. So money, when you take, for example, let's say I run all the business. I, I open a small business and all the money I borrow from Nordia Bank. Am I not under obligation to give the money back to Nordia? Am I or am I not? Okay. So 
that the money comes from is a financing. And this is a liability. Now money has come to me. Okay. I start investing. I was investing in the project. I from a piece of land. I have a building. I have factory. Uh, I'm investing it or I invest in R&D. Now the cycle starts. Okay. So what happens? Now when I invest, they become asset. They become asset of the business. All right. Now, how well you make use of your assets will determine if you are able to pay back to your funders or financiers or not. All right. So you have the assets, you can have the best machines, their assets, but the question is not that you have the best machines. Are you making the best use of those machines? There, that comes over So if you are a successful company and you know that you'll be paying 5% on average, people who fund you, who finance you, in that case, you must generate more than 5% returns from your investment so that the project is success. You get my point? And that depends how well you operate. You can make a mess out of the sophisticated state of the art machinery and technology because people who run the show on daily basis are idiots. You hire the agents. So you might have hired the bad agents. The bad man, remember the word I used, agent principal? If you hire, if the principal are in a position to hire the bad agents, uh, then hell may break loose on the company. So one yardstick of the company's uh, venture success is that, are you generating uh, at least more than the, the, the cost of financing? And this is the cost of capital, which we shall study. All right, and that will be your performance. So as long as the corporate performance is increasing, is running the bar, jumping over the bar, uh, that speaks that companies' operations are going well. Okay, so it's very important. And here you can see, I want to, you guys to spend some time on this. You can see there's an A, B, C a description written here. And this picture is basically a little bit extension of this picture. So you can understand this network better if you know first that a firm is a collection, uh, a firm is a triad, is a, is a, is a uh, what is it word called? It's like a kind of tetra, kind of three, three things uh, which are, we keep in mind, a firm is a collection of financing, investing and operations, okay? Operations would determine if this line is bigger or not, if the operations are successful, then this would overweigh this successful. Like, 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 a, like a weighing machine. And if your operations are not very good, then this would be smaller. Yes, it could be possible. Maybe, or maybe you don't have the right type of finance. You, you're a tech company, but you met those old fashioned bankers. It's very important. That's why it's very important that the tech companies, uh, for tech companies, it's very important that you, are you approaching the right kind of investor? For an old fashioned or the old economy company, it, it, it's, this is also important, but it's not that important uh, as a tech company. Hmm? Uh, because you are an idea based company, your idea is very important. But if the funder is very pushy, very nerve wracking, then it may not be a good situation for you. All right, I pause the recording. All right, so I can ask you, anybody can answer. Uh, there's a point A here, and in the picture it's here. So what does it mean, basically?
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this goes to this picture, the financing side. Okay. And you're right that where you get the money from, and you can see in the blue box here uh, that you get money from the financial markets that we shall study hopefully tomorrow in depth. Uh, it's not a guarantee. Uh, it's a secure, security, but not guarantee. But I, I'll explain it. Uh, if I'm a company and I want to get the money from you, uh, okay, let me build up an example. Let's say I'm a new venture or, a, or an established company. And I come to you people, my potential investors. And I say, hey guys, I have this idea and I want to implement it. Are you convinced? Do you like it? Say yes, you all say yes. But then I say, would you like to become my investor? Would you finance me? Now you're thinking. And let's say after thought process, it happens that I can see two groups in the class. Three of you go this side, three of you go this side. And three of you decide that, Shab, we like your idea. We want to finance you. My next question would be, which way you want to finance me? Do you want to become part of the business or have an arm's length distance? I'll explain it, what it means. You say, no, we want to become the shareholders of the company because we really love this idea. And we are very confident that this idea, if matures, would be a Zoom. And you, could, you said, no, we don't want to give you loan and get 2% rate of interest. No, we want to invest in your venture. So we are friends in every situation, thick and thin. If it is thick, the company grows, I share more profits with you. Or if I don't give you a dividend, at least the stock price can go up, for example. But anyway, you'll be getting more money. You want to become the shareholders. Right? So you are risk lovers. One thing is for sure that you are prepared to take risk. So it means that I give you a piece of paper. Nowadays, it's like a, even the DMAT, like it's on the online transaction. But I give you a piece of paper which shows that I give you so many shares and you give me money. This piece of paper is a security. Basically, it's a security because something is secure. Not, not full amount, but you're taking a big risk. We call it security for the namesake. These three people, they, they said, hey, are you, are you not giving me any money? Does it mean? Because you're not one of them. He said, no, we want to give you money. But we are less risk lovers than these people, three of you say. We give you money as a loan Okay, so you say that we, we, like, we trust you, we like you, we like your idea, but we still have some skepticism that maybe uh, if the money, if the venture is a failure, we would lose everything like them. We don't, we don't have so much of risk appetite. Mm -hmm. I say, fine, I'm happy. All right, I give you interest, give me money. For me, money is money, who cares? But then what happened that soon after, I can see two groups within you. You are separate and they too are separate. I said, well, what, what happened? Have you changed your mind? <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. They too say, we won't, we'll give you money, but we'll only give you money for a short period. We we'll give you loan, but for the short period. In finance, the definition or the benchmark between short and long is anything which matures under 365 days is a short period. Huh? Less than a year. Because if it is, it's not 365, it's less than 365. Up to 364 days. So as a rule of thumb, anything which matures under 365 days is called short term. So they give me loan 
but only for the short period. It means that I must give them back. I'm under obligation to give them back on pre 65th day. Am I right? Does this make sense? But he says, I'm ready to give you a loan for five years. So both are my lenders, but one, one group is short term lenders and one group is long term lenders. That is why there's a distinction between short term debt and long term debt. So basically, you all are investors, but you're not the same. You are shareholders, they are lenders or or debt holders, like if I say shareholders, I can say debt holders. But some of them are long term debt holders and some of them are short term debt holders. All right, this is point A. And how it happens? It happens through the financial markets. Right? Huh? Say again. All of you, all of you, all of you. <laughs> That's why I'm saying that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a guarantee. It's a security. Uh, it's not a guarantee. Even even debt debt holder can lose everything. If the company becomes bankrupt, nothing is there. They will even they will not get anything. But the only difference is that only difference is that if the company becomes bankrupt, you guys will be the first in the queue to get money from the assets, but they would be coming afterwards because they took the risk. It's their problem. They took risk. Did I, I didn't steal money from them. It was their informed decision to become shareholders. Because look at, look at your downside risk. If you're secure than them and my company success, I will only give you 2% rate of interest, but I promised. But with them, their stock price will zoom like anything. But then they also have the downside risk. But they also have the, well, I know that's, that's, I mean, yeah, if you, if you, if you can't face the music, then it's your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, That's a yeah, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. For the small company, I get your point. For the yeah. Uh, in, in the small companies, it's negotiable, but in the big companies, it's out of question. I mean, imagine I go to a broker and buy Nokia stock, and I tell the broker that, hey, please send me a message to the Nokia's head office that I will only buy your shares if you give me a job or if you make sure that I'm involved in some way. They would say, come on, who cares? Uh, but if it's a small company, uh, if it's a small company in a startup, yes, it is possible. It is possible. Uh, there are many entrepreneurs who themselves are the shareholders of the company. And believe me, uh, if you are an investor and the idea is also yours, you know better than the others, that the idea is really a gem. Then why should you accept salary? Go for the stock option. Because you know better that this company, but those people uh, who are a little bit more skeptic, they will not like to be the shareholders, at least in the beginning stage, but what they can do is that there's one more option for them, uh, for the lenders or the debt holders, that they can give me a convertible debt, which we shall discuss tomorrow in more in depth. Convertible debt, debt means they'll, they give me loan in the beginning on a trial basis. If I behave well, operate well, give them their interest, and now the project is in the intermediate stage, it has started generating the revenue and now they trust me. You know what? He's doing a good job. 
then they have an option that they can con they can convert the debt to shares all right but for this they have to wait but you guys because you have this niche you have, you you are the pioneer then you will be always ahead of them but then if the company or the project is a disaster then you would lose but then i am sure you are not a uh, you are not a professional gamblers you are investors you're not speculators if you choose to invest in the stocks i'm sure you must have done homework otherwise you will not do it i mean there's a better way to gamble than than investing stocks you get my point so when i say when i say that hey you are risk lovers i should be very careful that though you are risk lover people but you have done your homework you have done all these expenses because you know what you may not be the person but the institution so when you invest in my stock so when i take money from you i take money from you for me it's financing but for you it's investing and like you invest you also are responsible accountable to your finances so it's a knock on situation so i'm sure it's not a gambling thing you have done your homework all right so now we move to point i hope the point is clear okay let's go to point b now hmm point b which is here so the money goes it's self explanatory now i think it's when the money goes the money goes to the assets right and and i would show you tomorrow uh, that the company's asset side has two uh, sub categories the current assets and the non current assets the current assets are those which mature in a year and the non current are those which may mature for many many years may not mature okay so that is the two categories so that is where money goes to yeah so it's quite simple uh, then comes point c firms operations generate cash flow so the money comes money invested now the question is how well you are making use of those that money that depends upon your operational performance and one important yardstick that you are performing well recording it yeah uh is the oh sorry yeah one important part um is that how well you make use of your money and how well you operate is your cash flow how much cash you are able to generate are you able to pay back i have to give you dividends if you're old fashioned investor i have definitely to give them interest you can still wait for me they will not wait because it's a interest i have to pay it's a yearly interest but normally i have to pay two times a year six months after every six months i have to give them so i must generate uh, imagine there's a company whose 80% investors are debt holders and 20% are equity holders there's a more performance pressure on the company's uh, Uh, executive management the executive board the senior managers because they must generate at least that much cash flow that they are able to pay the interest to them right and if it is a growth based project you can you guys can still wait because it's your informed choice uh who has not spoken just karan mm you have to say something now how about d Hmm. Look, this is this is the function of the firm. Look, it's a this picture. I love this picture because it not only talk about where money comes, where money goes, but it's also talk the whole operation operationality of the firm. So for me, this picture is very important. Yes, sorry. Hmm. Hmm. yeah yes cash is generated yeah 
But the point is that cash is not given to the investors straight away. Uh, you pay tax. Remember, uh, your company is, is not run on planet Mars. You are on this planet, Earth. And in this Earth, you are making, when you run the business, you are making use of public infrastructure, social infrastructure, are you not? You are making use of it, then you have to give it, you have to pay the fee. Also. It's a liability in the sense that uh, it's expense. If you don't pay expense, it becomes liability, <laughs> right? But the, the point I'm trying to make is that you make use of social public infrastructure even though your company is one office, there is a, you bought the land, but are you not using the roads? Are you not using the infrastructure of the state? Are, you, are your employees not using the health services and all that? Okay, then pay taxes, all right? Not only the taxes, but you also have to pay some other expenses for the stakeholders. For example, the companies pay for the pension fund of their employees. The company, pays many other things to the stakeholders, right? So that, that thing uh, you must pay. So it means that uh, not, all the, not all the cash belongs to you people. You are investors. Look, you are debt holders, you are shareholders or equity holders. Put together, you are investors. Of course, you are stakeholders of the company, but apart from you, there are many other stakeholders. Suppliers are your stakeholders. Your customers are stakeholders. Your employees are stakeholders. The local community are stakeholders. Imagine you open a chemical factory near uh, Lake uh, Piani, and you're putting all the chemicals into it. The local people would have a problem with you. All right? You are making use of the local resources without paying them royalty. They'll be very angry. And moreover, stakeholders are not only uh, for this generation, if you do over industrialization, then you will leave nothing for the posterities. If you keep polluting the water, deforestation, do you think that the world would be a better place to live in for your grandchildren? Very difficult. So the stakeholders are not belonging to this generation alone. They also belong to the next forthcoming generation. And also, for Stakeholders are not only living stakeholders, even non-living, non-living. I don't believe in this word non-living, but so non-human uh, stakeholders are also possible. Okay? The nature, okay? uh, the nature is also a stakeholder. If you are uh, cutting down the forest, if you are raising the hills, okay? if, if you place military uh, on, the, uh, on the glaciers, or if there is a kind of uh, land grabbing and all these things, you are basically uh, tampering the nature, okay? Um, humans can wait, but if nature becomes angry, then the impact, the consequences can be disastrous. Haven't you noticed that in the last few years, uh, all these natural furies and catastrophes are becoming more frequent? That used to be not often a developed country's phenomena. But now recently, for the last few years, it has happened that all these furies of nature are equally striking uh, developed and uh, underdeveloped countries, rather more developed. Okay, isn't a signal? Well, we are making our stakeholders angry. Of course, you can't make the mother nature happier by giving her dividend, uh, the share of profit, but you must do something else too. So the, the whole idea is that, um, the money goes to uh, the government and the other stakeholders, society. Huh? The interest, that, that belongs to uh, that belongs to the F block. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
the, no the they are not they're not you it's a government it says government and other stakeholders not investors okay yeah so see what see i i quickly re repeat the money comes in you buy the assets making use, use of it cash generated okay with the cash you don't give the cash straight to the investors you pay tax you make money to the your money will definitely come don't worry yeah your money is on the way yeah just just be patient money is on the way yeah soon you will get money a lot of money yeah yeah not not all of course even in finland people get dividend so yeah so the money goes to the government and stakeholders let's say you have earned 1000 euros as a cash flow yeah and let's say the tax is 20% 30% so there's still some left over is there okay but not all of them goes to the share investors still the company has to grow in the future they keep some reserves for them all right so let's say 1000 is a profit cash flow uh, 30% is tax 700 is left okay out of 700 the company know that they have a lot of projects coming next year and they say that they will they want to use their internal capital and profit is the internal capital yeah uh, then let's say they keep 300 aside for the future reinvestment to reinvest that is called a reinvestment or the flowing back of the flowing back means recycling the money the money is generated for, by the business but you put it back in the all right and then out of 700 300 is reinvestment 400 is the uh, money left for you now depending upon um, of course i will pay them first definitely in the packing order i use a right uh, i use a phrase now packing order i can write it uh, the money company sharing order uh, you folks will come first than them or it could be even possible that i i all together owe you 800 700 i only have 700 so i'll give you everything they, they left with nothing all right so uh, in the packing order the debt holders will come first and then comes the shareholders and that completes our cycle this is a kind of life cycle it's a business plus finance life cycle. The money comes in, the money invested, the money churning out output, uh, the resources, and then comes the sharing of resources. If you look at the point, uh, D, E, F, it's all about uh, distribution of uh, success or failure, whatever. All right, so what do we do now? Uh, 